that we do have an obligation. And that doesn't mean we all have to be bodybuilders, or we all have to be nutritionists, or we all have to do these things perfectly, because that's not going to happen. And everyone's body and their metabolism does different things, and so they're not all going to look the same. But to, to really take care of our health uh, is important, just as we should take care of anything in our life. If we have, if we've received it as a gift, we have a responsibility for it. How do I have a personal relationship with Jesus? It's a good question, and I don't know that it's easily answered. You know, we hear about that, and, and Archbishop Lucas has asked us in this diocese to speak about that more, more to the point about encountering Jesus and having a relationship with Jesus. How do we do that? There's not going to be a one-size-fits-all. I think we have to pray. And as part of that prayer, I think scripture has to be a part of that. Uh, the Second Vatican Council taught very clearly, and even before that, the patristics, the fathers of the church, the ancient fathers of the church, taught that if we are ignorant of scripture, we are ignorant of Jesus Christ, period. That these are his words, and if we don't know the word of God, then we don't know the word of God made flesh. And we, don't, we can't have a relationship with him, because we haven't heard him. We haven't reflected with him. We haven't sat with him, and so on and so forth. So I think for to have that personal relationship, we have to take time for prayer, and we have to take time for scripture. And of course, all of those other things that we do, but ultimately, ultimately, I think it really is about taking time for prayer. Quiet, deliberate prayer. But that's how we begin to listen. Because part of our relationship with Jesus is not all of the talking that we do, but it's in the listening that we do. And that's why scripture is so important. Because it allows us to listen to what Jesus says, what God does, and to reflect upon it. So I think to really to develop a relationship with Jesus Christ is to listen. So maybe that means you have to take an annual retreat or a biannual retreat every couple of years. Maybe it means I have to have a certain time set aside every day for prayer. Or I need to carve this out, that the door is shut, and you know, don't bother me when I'm in this room because during this time, because that's my prayer time. Shut the phone off or, or schedule it. We have to do those things in order to have that personal relationship. And then, of course, active charity. If we're not living love, we're never going to know Jesus, because God is love. And so we have to live active charity. How am I giving love and receiving love? And that helps me to have that relationship with Jesus. So those might be a few things to help develop that personal relationship with Jesus. Maybe it's time for a spiritual director. If you find yourself kind of wandering in, in you know, I'm not sure where I need to go, but I know I need to go somewhere. And I just need maybe to meet with someone a few times to get on the right track or, or whatnot. That may be a possibility too. Or if you have a regular confessor that you go to and see it in a regular confession, that you begin to develop a relationship with that priest, and he's able to counsel you through particular directions that you can go in your life. So lots of different ways, I think, to begin that journey. Ultimately, it's God that does this. God is the one that establishes the relationship. All we have to do is be open to it. So the question is, am I carving out a place for that relationship to happen, or am I filling it up with all kinds of other things where I just, I'm not hearing, I'm not listening because I'm too busy or too this or too that. <clears throat> so maybe a couple things there. What is the difference between authentic rest and escapism, especially when it comes to things like TV or movies or other media? Like it could be, you know, these are definitely things for our leisure, but, or am I, you know, falling into these things, and it's not really leisure, but it becomes something else. It's laziness. So where's the, the line between leisure and laziness? And again, it kind of rests in all things moderation. You know, first of all, if we find ourselves binging on a particular program, and we've just sat there as a vegetable all afternoon, it's probably not leisure anymore. You know, that now has moved into the zone of, uh, of, of maybe a little bit of laziness. So authentic rest is rhythmic. 
It happens as a rhythm. You know, we see that in the, the designation of the Sabbath day, that in the Lord's day, that there is a time for rest each week, and it happens rhythmically. And likewise in our day, or just in, uh, in the course of our lives. And I know all of our lives are not a rhythm, and we're not able to say, oh yeah, my life is normal, and it always happens this way. But that's where we have to start. That leisure is something rhythmic. That I have to set the time aside sometimes for it. Because it's important. Otherwise, I'm going to pull my hair out. I'm going to be crabby. I'm going to be, you know, crazy. Whatever. We need to do that. Escapism uh, or, or laziness generally happens when we're running away from something. So when, when we recognize that I don't want to deal with something, so I'm going to go through this. Or I don't want to avoid. I want to avoid that uh, responsibility, so I'm going to go do that. That's where laziness then kicks in. That's where escapism kicks in. When we look at our motives, and it's no longer about resting and just relaxing, but it's about running from something. Leisure generally heads towards something. Escapism or laziness runs away from something. So that might help to balance some of those things. Try to keep a rhythm as best as possible. What's the difference between an oratory and a church? Like the Newman Center at UNO or at you know, some other place where you hear these titles, chapels, oratories, churches, cathedrals, shrines. And we've got all these different labels for the buildings that we have. Um, a church is a building, I'm going to say nine times out of ten, that is built for a certain community, typically a parish community. Churches tend to be for parish communities. Chapels tend to be for non-parish communities, but a stable community, so a school might have a chapel in a hospital might have a chapel in it, or a university campus might have a chapel on it, but it's not a church because that's not a parish. Now, St. John's Creighton University here in Omaha, that is a parish church. It has been established as a parish, so that is a church. But the chapel uh, at Notre Dame in Indiana, that is a chapel. It's not a parish church. As far as I know. So there are two different uh, things there. An oratory is, is basically a chapel in a sense that it serves a particular community or a particular part of a community, but isn't necessarily open for the whole parish or all the time or available for prayer. Uh, so a lot of times what happens or what you'll see, if, if parishes close, close because populations have shifted, particularly in the rural part of the diocese, or older national churches, we don't need a church on every block anymore, so maybe this church closes. It's not sold, but it's maintained as an oratory. So the sacraments can be celebrated there for people who have a particular connection there, baptisms, weddings, funerals, etc. but it's not going to be the normal place where our worship takes place. That's going to happen in the church. A cathedral is the mother church. Every diocese has one cathedral, and that is the house of the bishop's chair, where the bishop presides from. And so the cathedral is the mother church of the diocese, and a shrine is a church that is built for a particular devotion. So maybe it's the tomb of a saint. Or maybe there's a particular relic there. Or maybe there's a particular, you know, this shrine is the shrine of Our Lady of the Holy Rosary. And that is a place where people can go to experience the devotion of the rosary in a deeper, more profound way. So again, church is typically something that belongs to parish and is open and available to a community. The other designations are for portions of the community, depending on what they're serving. 
Traditionally, I always thought that the statues and crosses and images were covered only during Passion Week. Does, did this change at some point? Um, it's an optional practice to cover the crosses and images in a church during Passion Tide. And Passion Tide is not just Passion Week. Passion Tide is the last two weeks of Lent. So the question may be getting at this understanding of what is Passion, Passion Week. There's Passion Week that begins with Palm Sunday, or Passion Sunday, but Passion Tide is the two weeks, the week preceding Palm Sunday and the week following Palm Sunday. So they kind of bookend Passion Tide. So the Passion Tide is the time of the Passion, and that has been for some time uh, designated. And that's been the traditional time when crosses and images are removed from our site. Uh, but it's not mandatory that churches do that. So you may go to some churches and they don't cover statues and crosses during the last two weeks of Lent. You may go to others and everything is covered and remains covered until the Easter celebrations. Why is that a tradition? Why is that a tradition? Uh, it, it's, a, it's the culmination it really begins in the culmination towards the veneration of the cross on Good Friday. Because on Good Friday, the cross is revealed, in a sense, for the first time. Just as on Holy Thursday, when you come into the church, the tabernacle is supposed to be empty. In, a, in essence, when we celebrate Holy Thursday, the Last Supper hasn't happened yet. And so we are receiving the gift of the Eucharist for the first time. So nothing should be in the tabernacle. Otherwise, we're that. Same thing. Good Friday, this is the first time we are experiencing the cross. And so the cross is revealed for the first time on Good Friday. And so in preparation for that, all of the crosses and therefore the images in church are removed from our sight as we enter more deeply into the Lord's passion. And so it really is kind of that dying and stripping away of all of the things that aid our faith until they're given to us as gift. Okay. Did the Baltimore Catechism gloss over a lot of Catholicism and not get as detailed as it could be? I feel like I need a total redo of what being is taught now because it's not like anything I remember as a kid. For example, I don't feel that I was ever taught that God is loving, merciful, caring, but rather that we have to do what we're supposed to do or we go to hell. <laughs> One of the things that we have to uh, remember always is that the church's teaching remains constant. Individual catechisms that are created over time are going to express the faith of the church in different ways, responding to the needs of the time. So you're going to have, you're not going to find a discrepancy in the teachings of the faith, but you will find a different focus. So perhaps there's going to be more of a focus. For example, let me, give you, let me just give you an example. Uh, during the age of the Enlightenment, 1700s, 1800s, uh, science is growing, discovery is growing, and many people's faith thereby is dissolving, that, that there becomes less and less a focus on faith. And the people that do proclaim Christian faith, like our founding fathers at that time, profess a faith that is entirely distant from us that God is like some clockmaker sitting in an armchair somewhere. And he created the universe, wound it up, and now doesn't touch it until it all winds down. And that was the understanding that Jefferson and Franklin and Washington, our, our first uh, presidents and whatnot, that's, the exam that's their idea of God. And that was an idea prevalent in that age, that God does not interfere with the created universe. So what you end up seeing 
in the church at that time are very personal devotions. Eucharistic adoration begins to be a thing for the first time, to show people how close Jesus is to them. Apparitions of Mary are on the rise throughout Europe, demonstrating through Marian devotion how close the saints are to us. Um, the image of the Sacred Heart becomes a powerful image in the 1800s through St. Margaret Mary. Look at how much God loves you and the personal relationship he has. Frame this picture in your home, and the devotion of the Sacred Heart begins to take off. So, when the world seems to be more intellectually minded, the church seems to head more towards the heart. When the, church, or when the world seems to be more progressively minded, the church tends to go more traditional. Where the world seems to be more staunch and rigid, the church ends up being more merciful and, pro and, and progressive. So you end up seeing that there's a corrective in the way the faith is presented, depending on what the people of a certain age need. And so uh, it, it just is going to happen naturally. So the Baltimore Catechism is written in a particular time for a particular people to teach the faith in a particular way. And after a generation or two, that generation grows up and says, well, that was nice and all, but it seems like we were lacking in this. So the next catechisms and next religious ed programs that are written focus a lot on God's love and his mercy and feeling that and experiencing all of that, and not so much on the things of the head. And then that generation grew up and said, eh, I don't know anything about my faith. I feel God's love, but I couldn't tell you who he is. And so there's always a corrective in the way the church is taught, or we hope anyway, that that's what's going on as the faith is presented to us. Has it ever been presented perfectly? Probably not. Okay. Yes? Kind of related. Um, the Catholic Bible has, I believe, four more books in it. Several more books. More than just four. Not only uh, more books, but also more verses and chapters in some books. Okay. Why? Why is the Catholic Bible different from other Christian Bibles, uh, Protestant Bibles? The canon of Scripture was, or the, the official listing of, Bible, of books of the Bible, was pretty much set in the 4th century um, at the, the Council of Nicaea, more or less. That the bishops got together um, and basically decided, hey, these, uh, what, what, what books are we using for our Scriptures? What Old Testament books do we have? What New Testament books do we have? Because remember, there's no printing press, there's no internet, there's no, you know, so, hey, we've got a couple of these manuscripts, and we've got some of these manuscripts, and, and let's see what we're all kind of using. I'm paraphrasing and glossing, but that's essentially what happened. So that's pretty much established in, in the mid-fourth century. Um, what happens is... In the Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther's theology, he really struggled with certain aspects of the church's faith, particularly those that use very symbolic languages in Scripture. And because of that, he reverted to an older, less Christian understanding, particularly of the New Testament or the Old Testament. It's the Old Testament that the, the Catholic and Protestant Bibles will differ the most. We've got certain books that they do not. And the reason for that is because at the end of the first century, you've got all of these Jews who believe in Jesus Christ, these first Christians, and they come not only from Israel, speaking Hebrew, but also Greeks, that, and, and, uh, he, and, and Hebrews that speak Greek because of the diaspora and being sent away from the Holy Land. So you've got Hebrew and Greek-speaking Jews. They wrote those early scriptures in Hebrew, and some were written in Greek. When the Christians 
began to be more of a thing. A number of non-Jews are being Christianized, and they are free speakers, because that was the common language of the day. And so a number of these Greek books from the Old Testament were especially important to them because it was a language they read very easily. The Jewish rabbis were tired of hearing the name of Jesus being preached. So by the end of the first century, they hold a council and basically excommunicate from Judaism anybody who preaches the name of Jesus. And oh, by the way, take your Greek language with you. So anything that had been written, even by their own people, not in Hebrew, was expelled from the scriptures by the Jewish rabbis. So the Christians were using Hebrew and Greek works in the Old Testament. When Martin Luther set to, to translate the Bible, for whatever reason, he chose to follow the path of the Jewish rabbis rather than the first Christians. And he did not include the scriptures that were written in Greek. And a lot of those Greek scriptures use such imagery and symbols and language that he just had a real problem with. He didn't know what to do with scriptures that talked of dragons and, and fire and stars falling from the sky and all of these apocalyptic things. <coughs> apocalyptic literature really bothered him. And so he just didn't include it. And that's why the scriptures are different today. Because the Protestants adopted a non-Christian Old Testament. Okay. Since we believe in the virgin birth, how can we say that Jesus is descended from David? That he's the son of David. That he falls, falls in that lineage. If he, if he was born only from Mary as his lineage. A um, couple things. Uh, Joseph was certainly of the house of David. And we see that in God's plan, that God did not desire that his Messiah would be a blood kingship. That you inherit a kingship and a priesthood like Melchizedek, that doesn't have necessarily royal lineage. So you, as the son of David, is more of the spiritual than inherited uh, bond. That you are, in David's line, ideally, not necessarily by blood. Now also, it could be that Mary and her family came from the line of David as well. But we don't know where that, and we don't have all of that info for us, but, you know, that could be. I mean, Mary's father was certainly of the priestly class, and there may have been uh, an overlap there with the kingly class as well. But, but I think the important thing is, is that Jesus' priesthood did not come from Aaron, just as Jesus' kingship did not come from David. That Jesus' priesthood came from God. And Jesus' kingship came from God. So to inherit it through these men, that's not, as, that's not important for God. And in fact, he wanted to demonstrate that blood lineage was no longer an important thing. It's a spiritual family that he wanted to focus on. Good question. Why do we have two creeds? An Apostles' Creed and a Nicene Creed. And why is the Apostles' Creed called the, called the Apostles' Creed? It doesn't mention the Apostles. Um, the Apostles' Creed is the oldest creed. It is believed to have been taught by the Apostles. Uh, the oldest Christian writing, the oldest Christian teaching aside from Scripture, is a document called the Didache. And the Didache is written in Greek. And it's believed to be the first catechism, if you will, that was taught by the apostles. These are the things that were handed on to us by the apostles. And the Didache really reads like a catechism, that we, the believers of Jesus Christ, live this way. 
And here are the things we don't do, like all the people around us do. And it's in the Didache that you're going to find the first prohibitions against contraception, and against abortion, and against infanticide, and against all of the, and against uh, child pornography. You are going to find that all in the Didache, which originates in the first century. The first century! The apostles, the church, was teaching these things that we teach even today. These are expressed in the Didache already. The Apostles' Creed comes out of that, that here is our essential beliefs as taught to us by the Apostles. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. That is, you know, and it just kind of goes right through the 12 articles of faith that the Apostles' Creed contains. The Nicene Creed came out of the Council of Nicaea in 324, 45, and then completed in the, Const the Council of Constantinople in 381. That, that was basically the time when, again, the bishops came together and said, what is our common statement of faith? And they built off of the Apostles' Creed to deal with the heresies that were being taught at the day. So there was a real heresy about who Jesus was. He's not really God, or he's not really man, which is why in the Nicene Creed, we've got that big unfold. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial, one in being with the Father. And it goes on and on to combat the heresies of the day, that were saying Jesus Christ is not truly God. It was the church saying, uh, yes, he is. And we will go on and tell you why and how. So the Nicene Creed kind of grew out of that. There are other creeds, the Athanasian Creed and whatnot and so forth, but these are the, these are the two that are principal in defining our faith from the very beginning. So the Apostles is the most ancient, and the Nicene is an unfolding of that. And the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed is its official thing, but that's a mouthful, so we pretty much just say the Nicene Creed. Because we really didn't talk about the Holy Spirit much until Constantinople, so that he gets uh, 381, he gets his. How are the saints who are included in the litany and the Eucharistic prayers decided that they were the ones to be included? So you know, like in the first Eucharistic prayer, also known as the Roman Canon, there are two sets of saints that we identify. The first set, you know, we're going along and Mary and Joseph and Peter and Paul and Andrew and James, John, Linus, Thomas, blah, 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 blah. And you go through this whole list of saints. And then at the end of the Eucharistic prayer, John the Baptist, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Lyman, you know, blah, 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 and it goes on and on. The reason those saints were included, the first set is the listing of the apostles and the first popes. All of the people that are named after the apostles are the first people to succeed the apostles in Rome. At the end of the Eucharistic prayer, all of those saints after the scriptural ones, John the Baptist, Barnabas, Matthias, those are all the Roman martyrs. Those are the ones of the Church of Rome who were put to death during the persecution. And so because this was the Roman canon, this was the Eucharistic prayer that was written in Rome, that's why those saints were chosen in that one. In the litany of saints, that's a good question, because there are several different versions of the litany of saints. Some are much longer than others, like the one we use at Easter Vigil or during ordinations or whatever is a little bit more condensed version. And many of those saints are the movers and shakers throughout Catholic history, the ones who founded religious orders, and the ones who revived the church's faith at critical points in time. So that's why those are particularly chosen. Okay? Next. Why are the bells rung during the epiclesis of the Eucharistic prayer? Okay, first of all, what is an epiclesis? 
We should answer that. The epiclesis is the calling down of the Holy Spirit. Every sacrament we celebrate, there is the calling down of the Holy Spirit. And it is signified by the laying on of hands. That the laying on of hands is the calling down of the Holy Spirit. And so during the Eucharistic prayer, Lord, send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts. You'll see this gesture used once and only once. And during that time, there is a ring of the bell in some places. And that ring of the bell signifies the epiclesis. That, aha, the Holy Spirit is making his entrance. The Holy Spirit has entered the building. <laughs> that is, that's kind of that signal. Particularly, that was more important in a Latin liturgy when maybe you didn't understand the words that were being. So when the priest said, Hey, ergo dona quasimus spiritus tu aurora scientifica, whoa, the bells at least told you, aha, that's the part about the Holy Spirit coming down upon these gifts. Now, in some of the Eastern churches, they have a much more uh, fancy way of doing that. Uh, there are some Eastern churches, uh, Catholic churches, that they have what's called seraphim sticks. And they're basically these stabs that have uh, metal shakers at the top that are in the shape of angels. And when the priest is calling down the Holy Spirit, the uh, deacons or subdeacons or servers, I don't know who it is, they take these things and they shake them over, <laughs> over the priest and the altar as he is calling down the Holy Spirit. As the, you know, it's similar to the ringing bells that we do, but it's just very dramatic. These things, you know, hovering above you uh, in the shape of angels. And so we're a very visual, aural church. So that's what the bells ring. So likewise, again, with the elevation of the host and the chalice, the bells were rung to direct the focus, especially when you didn't understand or maybe you weren't paying attention because you were doing something else at that time. Okay? Quick question on that. Yes. How come Right. The bells are, the use of bells are not regulated in the liturgy. And traditionally, because the liturgy has changed over time, the bells have been rung at different times. There used to be a sanctus bell that would be struck, it's almost like a gong sort of thing that you would strike, and that, that indicated when the people were to kneel. Um, there were bells that were rung when the priest received communion to indicate that the sacrifice was complete. That in a sense, everything that needed to happen at Mass has now happened. And so the bell was rung to indicate the completion of the sacrifice. All the Roman Missal says today is that the bells may be rung at a time prior to the epiclesis. Right in there. So it's just kind of, you know, so it really is left up to local custom, local tradition. So yes, if you go to different churches, the bells may ring at various different times, and it's likely going to be dependent upon who the minister is, who the priest is, or the bishop is, that's celebrating that. Okay. Yes. Where in the Bible does it talk about purgatory? Uh, the word purgatory is never used specifically in the Bible. But there are particular moments in scripture where purgatory is alluded to. In other words, to die, there, there's, a, there's a belief in scripture that there's something more than the absolute. In other words, I die and I'm in perfect heaven. Or I die and I am in total hell. There's an illusion that there's something extra. Part of this comes from the Maccabees in the Old Testament. And again, the, this was one of those books that Martin Luther gave the boot to. And so when you get this, then the Protestants don't get this. But in Maccabees, 
Uh, they're talking about a battle, a horrible battle that took place, and how all of these Jewish warriors uh, were found dead on the battlefield. And when they were collecting the bodies, they found talismans of foreign gods under their cloaks. And it was like, oh my gosh, these people died denying the true God. What do we do? And the leader of the Maccabean army takes up a collection from the people, and he sends the money to Jerusalem so that sacrifices can be offered on the altar for those slain in sin. The reason, and it says in Scripture then, this was a noble and good thing that he did because they had in mind the resurrection of the dead. That if these people died denying God, and they were in hell, then offering sacrifice for them wouldn't do a darn thing. But clearly, we're troubled because they died in sin and they're not experiencing the joy of heaven. So, Scripture already begins to point out there must be this third in-between zone that people who die in sin, but maybe not totally in sin in, in their relationship with God, there's got to be uh, a way station, if you will where things get worked out. Jesus also himself will refer, and scripture, all throughout the Old Testament, scripture will talk about the purifying fires, not just the fires of Gehenna that destroy where there is no fire, but the worm dies basically in the filth, Jesus says, but also the scriptures speak of the purifying fires, to be refined, you will be refined like gold in the furnace, like silver in the fire, you will be purified. And so that there is a type of punishment that purifies. And even though it doesn't specifically speak of purgatory, the scriptures definitely speak of a time of purgation, a time of purification. And that's essentially what we as Catholics believe. Purgatory is a time of purification and purgation to enter into heaven. What do you think, what do you think Jesus wrote in the sand when the woman was about to be stoned? That's a good question. Uh, we don't know. Uh, it just says, you know, Jesus is there, all these accusers come up, they, they're ready to throw rocks at her, and it says Jesus was just tracing his finger in the sand. But it doesn't tell us what. It doesn't tell us he was writing anything, he was drawing anything, or doing anything. He's just tracing his, his finger in the sand. So, was he do, is it just a sign of like, uh-huh, I am not moved by all of your ire and anger? You know, basically a show to these Pharisees that, what are you all been out of shape for? Or there are some scholars that like to reflect and say, maybe Jesus was tracing a list of their sins in the sand. And you can see, hmm, he knows what, uh, he knows us in our hearts. We don't know. We don't know, and anything, anything we could say would be speculation, so I will refrain from suggesting. Could have been writing a novel, right? <laughs> Who knows? Um, why does a good God allow suffering? Um, one of the deepest questions of human existence. A good God allows suffering because it's the only way that free will can exist. That when God creates us, he creates us with free will. In other words, the ability to choose. Because that makes us like him. God is totally free. And so he gives us the power to be free and to choose freedom. And with that, with the ability to choose freedom, God then also takes an incredible risk that I also then am ready to accept whatever consequences your choices are going to be, whether good or bad. And so God allows evil because he allows and desires and wants free will. Without free will, without, without the possibility of evil, without the possibility of negative consequences, we cannot be free. If we could never make a decision contrary to God, 
we are not free. We have to be able to freely choose or reject God. And so with that comes the consequence. And God would rather have the consequence than not to have anyone capable of love. Because without freedom, it's impossible to love. You have to be able to have free will in order to love, which means you also have the ability to hate. And so, in order to have love, you have evil. And the two don't seem like they go together, but they kind of do. We just answered one of the most ancient questions. How do you like that? <laughs> Why did Martin, we already talked about Martin Luther. Um, why is the Protestant view of faith alone, sola fide, not correct? That we are saved by faith alone. We talked about that in October, so if you weren't here, I'm sorry. No, I'll go back. The reason why sola fide does not work, that faith alone, uh, on the one hand it does, on the one hand it doesn't. We, that we are saved by faith alone. That is true. It is faith in what Jesus Christ did for us that brings us our salvation. If you don't believe that, you cannot be saved. So faith is what gives us salvation. Nothing we can do, no merits, no works, no nothing, can earn salvation. It is by accepting in faith the gift of Jesus Christ that we are saved. So yes, we are saved by faith alone. But what does that mean? It's not my faith. It's not my faith that saves me. Because my faith is imperfect and flawed. It is the church's faith that saves me. It is the body of believers united to Jesus Christ that saves. We pray this at Mass every time we celebrate the Eucharist. Lord, Look not upon our sins, but upon the faith of your church. The priest prays that every time before we receive communion, that we know that, our, that we're sinful and that our faith is not perfect. So look upon the faith of your church, because the faith of the church is perfect. And when we unite ourselves to the faith of the church, which is the body of Christ, we have true knowledge of Jesus. We have true knowledge of the Father. We have our salvation. Yes, faith alone saves us, but not our individual faith. Our individual faith is incapable of saving us. It's Jesus Christ that saves us, so it has to be his body, which is the church that saves us. What does the bringing up of the gifts represent at the Mass, the offertory, bringing forward these gifts? That was a part that was added. Yeah, I don't know that it was... I guess it was very ancient, and then it disappeared, and then it came back in the revisions that the Mass has undergone. The bringing up of the gifts is talked about already in the second century. That when St. Justin describes the Mass and what happens at Mass, he says, after we have offered our prayers for the whole world, then gifts of bread and water and wine are presented to the presider who then offers a very lengthy prayer of thanksgiving over them, and they are made into the Eucharist, and so on and so forth. So he already talks in the early, uh, the, the earliest picture of Mass, that the offertory happens. What does it signify? It signifies that this bread and wine uh, comes from our work, that, that human beings have grown the wheat and the grapes and have made them into food and drink, and that we bring these gifts of our lives to the altar so that they may then be transformed by God and given back to us. So it's the work of our hands that we are bringing forward that then God takes and elevates to the work of his hands and then gives back to us as the body and blood of the Son. So the offertory really is, is a sign of our relationship with God. We're going to give him something, and he's going to give us something even better. Sorry. Sorry. Back. Yeah, I don't think it, it, 
came back. That was, it was in the ancient ritual, and then it kind of disappeared, and then uh, in the revisions, particularly after the Second Vatican Council, the offertory procession was reintroduced in a new way. Because it was seen as valuable. That it's, it's important for us to see that the bread and the wine just don't magically appear from nowhere, but that it comes from the people, and it's given to God, and then God, through his priest, gives it back as something better to the people. So there is a full circle that takes place. So do you see Vatican Council II as more of a... I remember Monsignor standing in his back and saying Mass in Latin all by himself up there on the altar, and we had no participation almost. So do you see Vatican Council II as bringing us into the participation? The goal of the Second Vatican Council in many ways was to stir up a greater participation in the liturgy and in the church's relation with the modern world. Like, how does the church relate to the world, and how do we enter into the participation of the liturgy so that we're not just sitting there passively? That is the goal. I don't know if those goals were always hit. We're still in the middle of figuring this out. When you look at the history of the church, uh, an ecumenical council generally takes about 70 to 100 years to really unfold because you're working out what, what was happening and, and getting some perspective. Because as you can imagine, in any age, just like when you write a catechism, you tend to be responding to different things. And what happens in a council is you go this way, and then people pull it back this way, and then it goes this way, and eventually it gets to where it needs to be going. And so this is why the church is often accused of moving very slowly, because the whole body has to move. It's not just my arm that juts out here, the whole body has to go with it. And sometimes it takes a while to get the rest of the body on board. And so the Second Vatican Council definitely uh, sought to do that. And I think we are figuring that out more and more. How we do that authentically without throwing the baby with the bathwater out the window, which is a temptation in any time of change or revolution. Okay. A couple more. Can you discuss an overview of St. John Paul II's theology of the body? Yes, I can. So, there are the questions. <laughs> Will I do that? I suppose, but in brief, because it's a very long thing. John Paul II spent a number of years unfolding the theology of the body, uh, which essentially, after he was elected Pope, on his Wednesday audiences. He spent a number of years, every Wednesday, just talking about the theology of the body, the relationship of man and woman, and the beauty of Christian marriage, and the gift of self in intimacy. Because he was convinced that the world, particularly following the sexual revolution, no longer understood what sexuality was, and in fact painted a very negative picture of that for the world. And the church hadn't adequately responded in a positive way. There were many thou shalt nots when it came to marriage and sexuality and intimacy, but there was not a whole lot of blessed are those who. So John Paul really strove to bring a beatitudinal approach to human sexuality and to present it as something very beautiful and not something that is um, finger pointing. So the theology of the body really goes back and roots itself in Genesis and, and begins to look at the scriptures of Adam and Eve and the relationship that is revealed to us between them and what our call is today particularly since we live in a post-fall world. 
that we are sinners and we are broken and we are no longer in original justice. So we are not naked. We are not in perfect communion with one another. We are not in perfect balance and harmony, but rather there are these things that are built up between us. And now we have to get over that. And so that's essentially what the theology of the body is. I mean, I could go into a lot of detail about it, but we would have to be here for another full session. So maybe one day we'll cover St. John Paul's uh, theology of the body, but it really is a very beautiful uh, image of human sexuality and why that is something to be celebrated and not something to be feared or destroyed. Because we live in a world where fertility is seen as a disease that has to be cured. Your fertility needs to be cured because it interrupts my life. And that is a very destructive way of seeing, especially the woman's body. And, and I think we were reaping the consequences of that in our society today. And you only have to look around and see the Me Too movement and everything else that's happening in secular society about the disrespect that the woman's body has received over time that we have cultivated in modern secular society. And eventually, even secular non-Christian people understand that's a bad thing. The church has been saying this for a very long time. Uh, so it's, it's about time that we see that actually coming to fruition in the secular world. These are things that have to happen in conversations that need to take place. Yes? Why doesn't the church say more about sexual assault in our society? It's very prevalent, especially in the lower classes. Women that work in the service industries, and the, the harvest, food harvesting, and that kind of thing is very prevalent. It seems like that's something the church should talk about. Um, should the, why does the church not address sexual assault or, or the, the, the other issues around that. Um, I, don't, I don't know that it does. That's not my experience of that. I guess I read a lot of what the church proclaims, and I read a lot of it. I never hear anything on, from the pulpit on it. Oh, yes. And that's a good question. People will always ask me, why don't we hear you talk about this from the pulpit? Because we have a lot of young ears in church. And the pulpit is not the place to talk about certain things. That's not the gospel. Those, some of those moral issues, particularly when you get uh, things that young ears should not be hearing or exposed to, those are things that have to happen in the church's documents, in the letters that go out. I will address many of those things in the bulletin, but these are not always things that can be preached about. I am not going to get up and give a homily about rape and sexual assault and then have my three-year-old come to mommy and say what's rape and sexual assault. I'm going to get a lot of angry letters, and rightly so. So there are some things that does not, should not be from the pulpit. Priests often get lambasted. Why don't you talk more about contraception from the pulpit? For the very same reason. That is not the place for it. It's not the place for it. The pulpit is the place to preach the gospel. It's not the place, it's not the place to deal with all of the complicated moral issues necessarily that our world experiences. They are things that the church needs to talk about. And I will agree with you that in many cases, because the pulpit is not the place where those should be heard, there is no other place where they have to <coughs> That, well, we don't have a place to talk about that, to learn about that, to announce that, to study that, to do whatever. We have been very bad, in a sense, of doing that. Because I think for many of us, we just assume that the pulpit is the only place where Catholics have that kind of experience, or that that's where it should take place. And we, we really have, that's where we can learn from some of our Christian brothers and sisters, that there's more than just Mass as a Christian. We have to do more things than just come to Mass on Sunday that we have to have our, felt, our faith and develop it in lots of different ways. Because there are important things that we need to talk about. Human trafficking, oh my gosh, you never hear about that. 
But then when we have these speakers come in, I know the Knights of Columbus had uh, hosted something on that, and the diocese hosted something on that, and to hear these speakers talk, it opens your eyes to what's going on out there and things that we have to hear about. There's a lot of, of things out there, uh, and unfortunately, you know, we have to strike that balance of, of young ears and yet at the same time move people to conversion. We have a couple minutes before we're snowed in. <laughs> if you're watching this, wherever you are, it's snowing right now. <laughs> yes? One more. On the uh, subject of contraception, what's the church's position on vasectomy? What is the church's position on vasectomy? That's a uh, type of birth control, isn't it? What's that? It's a type of birth control. It would be, it would, yes, it would be, yeah. That there, I don't know that there is a therapeutic reason for a vasectomy. And so the church would identify that as a mutilation of the body. And mutilation of the body would be grave reason. That every act of, of, of human sexuality needs to, in some way, be unitive and open to the possibility of life. That doesn't necessarily mean that we have to be having children constantly but that we don't disrupt that in some unnatural way. Um, is there any uh, like, I guess medical reason that any kind of contraception would be a struggle that seems very discussion? Are there any medical reasons where contraception could be introduced into a relationship? Um, you know, these are the discussions that theologians have. Presently, the church does not does not have does not speak about you know here are certain situations where it would be acceptable for contraception to be used, but theologians certainly discuss that. Bishops certainly discuss this. Joseph Ratzinger, before he was Pope Benedict, certainly discussed this and had to deal with these sorts of questions. You know, there's a lot of unknowns yet and. Particularly when you're dealing with situations where there doesn't seem to be a good answer or response. You know, some of the situations that arise is <clears throat> if I am married and my husband has contracted some kind of disease that can be transmitted sexually, is it not acceptable to maintain the conjugal life, the use of contraception, namely a condom, in order to preserve the health of the wife. You know, those are the, the questions that, that have arisen, and you could probably argue that theologically several different ways. Um, and I know that there is open conversation right now, but there is no change in teaching in terms of that, that contraception can be accepted right now. One of the interesting things that I always find out when it comes to the discussion of contraception is very, very few people have ever read Humanae Vitae which was Pope Paul VI's declaration on the evils of contraception, and nobody really understands what the church teaches about contraception, except that, oh, I think it's a bad thing. We're not supposed to do it, but we do it anyway. They have not read, uh, like, the beauty, again, the beauty of sexuality, and why it kind of deforms that, and what it does to, to, to the human relationship in that. Yes. Is it wrong for uh, Catholics to participate in non-Catholic uh, Bible studies, particularly Bible study? Is it wrong for a Catholic to participate in, is, uh, except for example, Bible studies, especially if they come out of a non-Catholic Protestant or non-Catholic tradition? It is not wrong. It's not wrong to do that. I mean, these are areas where we ought to cross uh, over and engage our brothers and sisters in the Christian faith in various ways. Um, it also depends upon the strength of the person's faith. Because, especially if it's a scripture study that is not Catholic and is, is driven from a non-Catholic Christian perspective, there's going to be a different way of reading the Bible and interpreting the Bible that is foreign and maybe even not uh, correct in terms of approaching scripture. 
that there will be an aspect or so left out or not appreciated or more entered into. So it depends what kind of scripture study is, how old the person is. You know, if you're thinking about sending, you know, your 12-year-old to a interdenominational Christian Bible study, I think that's not a good idea because I think that person is going to just get kind of carried away with the, whatever emotion moves them down the, the river. Whereas maybe someone who's a little more sturdy in their faith, that's not going to be much of an issue. So definitely share what we can share, but also you know remain grounded in, in the fullness of the truth. What was the general cause of the schism between the Eastern churches and the Roman church? And why can we still fulfill our Sunday obligation by going to the Orthodox church? Uh, the great schism of 1054. What was the, 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 the general cause of that? We'll boil it down as much as we can. 1054, here's the short history. Constantine moves from Rome to Byzantium, a little town that's a, on a luscious part of land and some rivers. He wants to build a new capital. Constantine, the emperor, moves from Rome to Constantinople, naming it after himself, and it becomes modern-day Istanbul. When he does that, all of the political world, the military, the wealthy, follow after him, leaving Rome in destitution and ruin. So this is in the 5th century, 4th, 5th century ish. Rome is basically forgotten as Constantinople grows as the new center of the empire. As these two uh, realities grow up, there is nobody of an educated class, a powerful class in Rome left to govern except the clergy. And so the Bishop of Rome essentially becomes the Western Emperor. And he is the one to raise up armies. And he is the one to raise up hospitals and orphanages and street cleaning crews and all of these sorts of things. Rome grows in power. The position of the Pope grows in power. Uh, the Emperor in Constantinople, not so appreciative of that. And so what you begin to see is political division between East and West over governance and politics. Politics is always the problem. Politics between these two. Rome speaks Latin, uh, Constantinople speaks Greek. Now when we send emissaries back and forth, because we're really not learning each other's language, a lot of miscommunication starts taking place, even among the Christian faithful, so that Greatly simplifying here, when Rome says, we believe in one God, three persons. Constantinople, translating that from the Latin into Greek, hears the Romans say, we believe in three unique gods. The Greeks say, we believe in one God in three persons. The Romans, translating Greek into Latin here, we believe in one God who puts on three different masks, depending on who he's pretending to be at a different moment, based on the language that we're using. So the Romans say unto the Easterners, you are in heresy, recant or be excommunicated. And the Easterners say to Rome, you are in heresy, recant or be excommunicated. And what happens is they mutually excommunicate each other. And there is the great schism between the two. And then history just moves us a little further apart. Uh, the, the big thing is, two points, the Eastern churches did not completely en masse go away from Rome. Every one of those Eastern churches split. You had those that were Orthodox and those that would be Catholic. And so now you have Greek Orthodox and Greek Catholic. Russian Orthodox, Russian Catholic. Syrio, you know, Coptic Orthodox, Coptic Catholic, whatever. You're going to have every branch by the Catholic and Orthodox side to it. Um, in that schism, unlike the schism of the Protestant Reformation, those that separated from Rome did not abandon the faith or the practice of the faith. All of their bishops 
remain in the apostolic line, which means all of their priests remain in the apostolic line, which means all of their sacraments are valid. So the Orthodox and the Catholic churches maintain valid bishops, priests, and sacraments. So we are to fulfill our Sunday obligation in a Catholic church if possible, but if I am in a region where there is no Catholic church, I can go to an Orthodox church because those still have valid sacraments. And if I were to go into an Orthodox church, I would genuflect to the tabernacle because that is the body of Christ in that tabernacle. They're separated, but they never deny the faith. That did not happen in the Protestant Reformation. In the Protestant Reformation, not only was there a split with Rome, but there was also a denial of parts of the faith. And at that point, they ceased having bishops, ceased having priests, ceased having sacraments. And Orthodox uh, attend Catholic, and that be the case. Yes, I was preparing a couple one time for marriage. He was Roman Catholic. She was Bulgarian Orthodox. There is no Bulgarian Orthodox church nearby. So because she had no access to her own proper church, and because we believe that all essentially the same thing and share the same sacraments, she received sacraments from me as a Roman Catholic minister. She went to communion regularly. She went to confession because... She acknowledged the validity of our sacraments, and we acknowledge the validity of hers. But there's no Bulgarian Orthodox Church here in Omar. Okay, yes? What do we do with all the things that we did from history that say we're going to stuff like that if they want to send them for us? If they send you things in the mail, we're going to send you this thing to guilt you into giving us money now. And you know, here's this thing that is a, uh, a medal. We're going to send you this little cross. We're going to send you this little medal. We're going to send you. Hopefully, they're not sending relics through the mail. I don't know. Or this thing was touched to the grave of so and so, like a third class relic. You know, this this you know holy card was touched to the grave of Saint Pope Saint John Paul II. You know, now it's a third class relic or whatever. Oh, I know those things annoy me because it's like, I don't need to have boxes of stuff in my life, no matter how good it is. So either give it to someone who has a great book of de devotion to these things, or to these people, uh, or uh, when you're telling up your garden, throw it in the ground and bury it, or burn it in the fireplace to grill when you fire things up. <laughs> if you want to dispose of a blessed or holy object, you either bury it or burn it. If possible. Well, I don't know. I suppose it depends who you get it from. If it's coming from, like, you know, the Carmelites or whatever, you, you should assume they're not lying to you. But if it's coming from, you know, I don't know, some other crazy group. <laughs> I'm sure. What I do, if I see this, I just don't bother opening the envelope and I just put it in the trash. Then that way I am absolved of any guilt. Because I don't know what's in that envelope. <laughs> there it is. So at least into the recycling bin. Yes. Let's, yeah, maybe one more. Devotions to the saints. Do I have that? How do you encourage others to grow in devotion to the saints? That's something I struggle with. You know, being Catholic all my life and whatever, I never really felt a need to have intercessory prayer or devotion to the saints. Why don't I just have a relationship with Jesus? You know, da 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 da. And um, I don't know where the, the switch, oh, I'll tell you where the switch got flipped. I was going on retreat one time, and I just remember I had this intense urge to ask people to pray for me. It's like, I'm going on retreat, and for some reason, I just keep getting this sense that you need to pray for me. Would you pray for me on retreat? Would you pray for me on whatever, whatever? And, you know, I had a powerful experience at that retreat, and I realized then that, you know, these other people lifting me up was so helpful. Now, we can think of the scripture passage where the, the paralytic was lowered on the mat the feet of Jesus because he couldn't get there himself. And it was his friends 
who brought him to the feet of Jesus. And that's really the relationship we have with the saints, that we, we ask them in our lameness to bring us to the feet of Jesus, because we don't even know how broken we are or how incapable of, of moving towards Jesus we are. And so that really kind of opened my eyes. And I, I really began to develop a devotion to certain saints who revealed a different aspect of God to me. So first and foremost, there are three that stand up. Peter, Mary Magdalene, the Archangel Raphael. Each of these three have a particular relationship with God that is unique and speaks to my heart in, in some way. And then I would probably say um, John of the Cross, because his prayer and mysticism echoes my own. When I read him, it's like he's reading my mind. And so his approach to Jesus and to God is my own. So I really rely on John of the Cross as a spiritual uh, friend. And finally, uh, Teresa of Calcutta and John Paul II, that these were the two people that growing up, I knew, and, and you know, they formed who I was in my picture of Catholicism. And so I rely on both of them, Mother Teresa especially, because she does things I can never do. And yet my heart desires to grow in those kind of things, but I know that's not my life. And I need her to help me in that. And John Paul II, because his was the model of priesthood that I bought and followed. So I think it's just finding, you know, that, that, that those sayings, when something hits you, that I can learn something about God from that person, just to begin maybe reading a little bit about them, or practicing a little bit what they practice, and that might help start the devotion. Okay. Well, let's close uh, with a prayer, and then if you want to stick around and ask questions, certainly welcome to, and if you need to go shovel out your car, you can do that too. <laughs> Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.